Hello, AP Statistics students. This is Ms. Skoken, and we're going to work on the next set of notes. I know that you may be interested in taking a look at your textbook and seeing how it corresponds to where we are in the notes. And we're basically at the, at the very end of section 4.1, which begins, or the part that we're going to talk about today, begins on page 261 in your vital source textbook. Let me know if you have any questions about finding that. I'm happy to help you find it in the textbook. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Lesson 4.1, day four, what is wrong with this, these surveys? Identify what's wrong in each of these surveys and be sure to explain. So what I would like for you to do right now is pause the video and go through and read. In your own words, explain what's gone wrong with each of these different survey administrations. There are three different questions and there's an A question and a B question for each one. When you're finished going through all of these, turn the video back on and we'll kind of recap what my answers were, as well as some notes that I want you to take in addition to whatever you wrote down originally. Please pause the video now. So the mayor of Springfield is interested in finding out the average age of people in the city. He obtains a list of all the landline telephones in the city and then contacts a simple random sample of 300 people. He uses the data from the sample to estimate the average age of all the people in the city. What's wrong with this survey? The mayor is only asking people with landline phones. So that means anyone who doesn't have a landline phone is not included in the survey. This is called under coverage. And this will probably lead to the mayor overestimating the average age because People with landline phones generally are old, older or old, and so that means that the respondents to the survey are going to be older than is representative of the average age of the people in the city. In number two, the administration at a school wants to know the proportion of students that did all of their homework last night. They select a simple random sample of 100 students and send an email to each of them asking if they did all their homework last night. They only got 40 responses. So out of the 40 responses, 36 of the students said that they did all their homework last night, which is 90% of the respondents. What's wrong with this survey? Well, to begin with, only 40 responded. The others refused to respond. This is called non-response. And unfortunately, sometimes in situations, the respondents to a survey do not tell the truth. And in this case, students might lie and say they did their homework even if they didn't because since the administration is asking them, they don't want to look bad. So they either won't answer the survey, and that's why they only had 40 responses out of 100, or they might lie. So this is what we call response bias because the answers are not truthful for one reason or another, in this case, because students probably don't want to look bad. In number three, Boy Scout Peter M. wants to know the proportion of people in his neighborhood who support the Boy Scouts. He, take a sim he takes a random sample of 30 homes and visits them dressed in his Boy Scout uniform. What's wrong with this survey? Because Peter is wearing his uniform and asking face-to-face -face of his neighbors, he's probably influencing their responses. They're not going to want to say that they don't support Boy Scouts because they know that he is one, even if they don't. So this will likely lead to Peter overestimating the proportion because people are going to be afraid to tell the truth if they don't support Boy Scouts. Again, this is an example of response bias. And in this case, Peter actually created the bias because he wasn't neutral. He actually presented himself as a Boy Scout which, of course, could lead to the people feeling uh, unable to tell the truth if they, don't, if they don't support Boy Scouts. All right, let's take a look at our box of important information. One of the new vocab terms we just learned is under coverage. And this is when some members of the population either cannot or are very, very unlikely to be chosen. This is the example that they used landlines to contact people. Same thing could be said of mail-in surveys or cell phone surveys. Another new vocabulary term that we learned was non-response. And this is when an individual is chosen to be part of the sample, but they elect not to be. 
So this is kind of that refusal to participate or we can't actually get to them for some reason. This is different from voluntary response. Voluntary response is when they select to be part of the sample. Uh, you need to make sure you understand the difference between under coverage that is a systematic leaving out of some people or some subjects and non-response, which is when they are part of the sample, but they just choose not to participate. And finally, we learned response bias, which is when we have a pattern of systematic inaccurate responses. This could be due to poor wording of the survey, to bias imposed by the interviewer, such as the Boy Scout uniform, uh, the respondents not being truthful for one reason or another. Anyhow, so response bias is when we're trying to get the responses, but we're not getting accurate responses. So they're not truly representative of the opinions of our population. Okay, that means that we've gotten to the point of the check your understanding questions, which means that the lesson video it has concluded. You're going to work on your check your understanding and then remember to go on to the posted notes so that you can check your responses. Good luck and I'll see you back in class.